welcome you to uh, another sermon message from uh, myself. Looking up series is what we're looking from. Uh, Be anxious for nothing from Philippians chapter 4 verses 4 through 8. When I'm doing my yard work, I quite often connect to my child self, remembering back to, to those persnickety neighbors in my youth. They used to scold us for running and playing in their yards. I thought it silly to be so anxious about one's lawn looking so perfect that when we were having a perfectly wonderful time playing in their yards. They were meticulous about their yard care, not allowing a weed nor a skid mark where I tried to slide into third base uh, to happen on their yards. I determined that then and there that I would never get so anxious over having a perfect yard that it became more important than hearing the laughter of children playing in the neighborhood. Although I do realize that they had uh, justifications for being a little unreasonable or a little upset anyway of scolding us. Uh, by accident, uh, we may have kicked a ball through the game-winning field goal through their basement window. And then while they were at work, I, yes, I do admit that we did dig some holes for a short nine-hole golf course throughout everyone's yards in the neighborhood. <laughs> but we were quick to fill in the holes before they got home from work, but somehow they caught on uh, what we were doing, even though we were such well-meaning and good-natured children, of course. <laughs> well, reading from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. As a child playing and loving life, I thought uh, for those who were worrying about manicured yards, uh, C.S. Lewis wrote of such people who refuse the greater joy in, of the Lord in their life in a present time when he said this, When infinite joy is offered to us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday by the sea, we're far too easily pleased. Well, spiritually speaking, we tend to major in the minors and fail to rejoice in our present Lord. His desire is that we live uh, with a great joy because he is present with us. Verse 4, charo, is an important word. And as Paul is stating and restates this emphatic command to rejoice, the Message Bible puts it this way, celebrate God all day, every day. I mean, revel in Him. Just as Hannah's heart burst open in prayer with a praise, my heart rejoices in the Lord, in the Lord my horn is lifted high, my mouth boasts over the enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord, there is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God, from 1 Samuel chapter 2. Instead of rejoicing like the little children at play, we get sidetracked quite often by life's seriousness. And too easily we can become grumpy neighbors who get irritated by the playful squealing of children loving life with the Lord. U.S. Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. admitted that he might have entered the ministry if certain clergymen he knew had not looked and acted so much like undertakers. People who knew the Lord intimately but did not see the joy in it. Joy for a Christian is a realization that their faith is in the Lord. This is a powerful, especially when one is faced with difficulties in life of hurts, of trials, and grief. A third century man anticipated his death as he wrote to a friend these words. It's a bad world, an incredibly bad world. 
But I have discovered in the midst of, a, of it a quiet and holy people who have learned a great secret. They have found a joy which is a thousand times better than any pleasure of our sinful life. They are despised and persecuted, but they care not. They are masters of their souls. They have overcome the world. These people are the Christians, and I am one of them. With so great a hope in Christ, Paul reminds us that we too should be glad and rejoice. And one way in which the community will see you rejoicing in the Lord, and not necessarily as you run around in the street in tights, dancing and singing to the Lord, but by your magnanimous personality, as verse 5 states, forbearing, moderation, and gentle. It's being high-minded, kind, and noble. The opposite of petty, just as I determined not to be petty about a weed or a mess of a child in my yard. And with God's help, I pray I will always be generous towards my neighbors. Having that attribute was so important to God uh, that Paul commands us to show evidence through our lives to all people. As Apostle John says, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Show your magnanimous character by being courteous, loving, and respectful to all, which is predominantly the character of Jesus. When it is said that Jesus was meek and gentle, it doesn't mean that he was, was weak, rather that he meant he willingly submitted his personal comforts and relinquished his rights to the needs of others. Missionary Eunice Pike had worked with the Mazat Mazatec Indians in southern, southwestern Mexico and learned some interesting things about them. For instance, they seldom wished someone well. Not only that, but they were hesitant to teach another or to share the gospel with each other. If asked, who taught you to bake bread, the village baker would probably answer, I just knew. Meaning that he had acquired the knowledge without anyone's help. Eunice said this odd behavior stems from their concept of a limited good. They believe that there's only so much good to go around, so much knowledge, so much love to go around. To teach someone else meant that it would drain yourself of knowledge. To love a second child would mean that you had love, less love for the first child. To say have a good day meant that you had given away some of your happiness which could not be reacquired. Instead, Paul teaches us that the Lord is near. His Spirit is here to guide us, instruct us, to equip us, infuse strength, to assist us, transform us, and renew us. Christians never need to be concerned about running out of joy within themselves and the graciousness towards others because God is there to ever fill us up. Verse 6 goes on to say, don't be anxious about anything. I quite often impose the 1980s song titled, Don't Worry, Be Happy, into this verse. It was such a cute song that you couldn't help but smile when it came on the radio. Do not carry your future burdens upon yourself, for they only produce an unreasonable anxiety. Paul and the Philippi church had ample reasons for anxiety since the one was in the prison and the others were, were threatened with persecution. But as Chuck Swindoll said, worry pulls tomorrow's cloud over today's sunshine. Worry is faith in the negative, trust in the unpleasant, assurance of disaster, and a belief in defeat. Worry is wasting today's time to clutter up tomorrow's opportunities with yesterday's troubles. In his first inaugural address, uh, President Roosevelt shared this memorable point. Let me assert my firm belief that only the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. 
nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. So what does anxiety do? It does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow, but it does empty today of its strength. It doesn't make you escape the evil. It makes you unfit to cope with when it comes. God gives us the power to bear all sorrow of his making, but it does not guarantee to give us the strength to bear the burdens of our own making, such as worry induces. What then is the alternative to worry? The alternative is prayer. Believing that God is greater than the greatest problem, and that he is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. Paul strings three synonyms together, prayer, petition, and request. He's emphatic about what he had learned, that, that the way to be anxious about nothing is to be prayerful about everything. Prayer is recognizing God is there with you during your troubles. It's a personal conversation with him about what is troubling you and a plea given to God who hears you, cares about you, and understands what you desperately need. If we don't have a personal caring God that we can go to, we will sink into despair. And sadly, I believe that is what is, we're seeing in the world today. As carriers of the virus uh, called Christ rejoicing, his church urgently need to infect the world with that life of hope and joy and love in the Lord. When we say petition, we think in terms of intercession on behalf of a brother or sister in poverty, needing what they lack. If I were imprisoned, I'm sure my greatest prayer concern would be for my release. Yet his brothers and sisters in Christ are facing persecution and growing anxiousness. So Paul prays for the greater need of their unity, of their mutual concern, their peace, and a love within the brotherhood of all believers. That's a prayer of intercession for their faith to remain strong. And it reminds them to pray with thanksgiving, a Eucharista, a gratitude directed to God. Thanksgiving means giving God the glory in everything, making room for him, casting our care upon him, letting it be his care for us. And the best way we can do that is to look back on how God has seen us through past troubles and place our trust in the future to his care. And lastly, in verse 7, a peace of God is huge. It comes when God fills the believer as he stands firmly in his position in Christ. The peace of God is found nowhere else in the New Testament. It is the tranquility of God's own eternal being, the peace of which God himself has, the calm serenity that characterizes his very nature in which grateful, trusting Christians are welcome to share. As a result, inner strife from worry ceases and eternal strife from disagreements also may come to an end. It's distinguished with a peace uh, with God which is a result of justification by faith in Jesus Christ, Romans 5.1, where we are made right with God through Jesus Christ so that we have peace with God. But the peace of God is a deeper peace, a walking with God that keeps on guarding, protecting your mental, your emotional, and spiritual life from the enemy intrusions. The peace of God protects our hearts and our minds, which is a a military term of a detachment of soldiers standing guard over them, refusing the spiritual attacks from entering our lives. Our assurance of hope comes from the great work of God's redeeming love based upon a historical fact of Christ's death and resurrection. Redemption, that is, from the, for the Philippians and for us today as well. Believing and placing faith in what God has done for us produces a joy overwhelming. A rejoice and be glad. Don't worry, be happy, for God is here. Remember, all that he has done for you 
and present all your concerns before his throne. Bruce Larson shared a, an interesting point in a sermon message. At a conference at a Presbyterian church in Omaha, people were given helium-filled balloons and told to release them at some point in the service when they felt like expressing the joy in their hearts for the Lord. And since they were Presbyterians, Bruce Larson said, they weren't free to just burst out shouting, hallelujah, praise the Lord. So all through the service, balloons ascended. But sadly, he said, at the end of the service, over one third of the balloons were still unreleased. The people had not found a moment in time in which they could find joy in their hearts to release their balloons. I pray as you recognize God's nearness and love for you, that you will release your balloon and praise the Lord for his presence, his love, and his blessings that rain down upon us in Christ's name. Amen.